All right, here we go. Well, hello and welcome to our fourth webinar of our OPI Indian Education for All Background Knowledge Series on Sovereignty. My name is Jennifer Statham and I am an Indian Education for All Implementation Specialist at OPI. Thank you so much for joining us on this snowy evening. Hopefully we're all traveling safe, safely to get to our, our webinar and then our homes this evening. Each webinar will be recorded and participants will remain on mute with your cameras off so we can focus on the presenters and their content. A link to the recordings as they are available is on our Indian Ed webpage, and we actually have consolidated that into a playlist. So you can just look at the playlist and see all of, um, all of the additional webinars that we'll be adding as we record them. And uh, please feel shared at few Feel free to share those links out. They have just been phenomenal. If you've missed any, I highly encourage you to go back and watch the recordings. <clears throat> Excuse me. So feel free to use the chat if you have any questions or comments. We will take a few minutes at the end uh, to uh, answer any other questions and answers you have. So, so if you have you know questions during the webinar, please feel free to throw them in there, and I'll find a time um, to ask Senator Morjo your questions. Your feedback on the feedback surveys from our other webinars, remember, has brought you this sovereignty series. So whether you are seeking professional development units, formerly known known as renewal units, or you are a member of the community learning more about tribal sovereignty, please fill out your the surveys. They've just been incredible. Um, I, I really appreciate your, your honest thoughts, and it's helping to teach us and uh, helping to and develop further programming such as this. So please make sure that you fill those surveys out. It'll be available the last 15 minutes of the uh, webinar, and then it will only be open until tomorrow afternoon. So please make sure to take those few minutes to get that submitted. Tonight, I would like to introduce and give a warm welcome to someone I've gotten to see grow into his role of a state senator over the past seven years, Senator Shane Morgeau. Shane was born and raised in Ronan and lives in Missoula. He is a proud Salish and Kootenai member and grew up hunting, fishing, hiking, and biking right here in Montana. Shane is a former Grizz and he attended the University of Arizona Law School. He spent his summers fighting fire and getting his pilot's license. Shane began his career as an advocate and attorney representing the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and helped pass the CSKT Montana Water Compact and Medicaid expansion in 2015. Prior to joining the CSKT as a de deputy executive officer in December of 2021, Shane served as a prosecuting attorney and general legal counsel for over a decade with CSKT, the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribes is CSKT. Elected as a state representative and minority whip in 2016, and in November 2020, Shane was appointed to serve out the term for Senate District 48, and he was just reelected. So congratulations, Senator. We are delighted to have you here with us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. And um, thank you all for taking the time to, you know, educate yourselves on what I believe is a very important um, subject matter uh, that should be really learned about and taught in our schools. Um, before I get started, uh, do my disclaimer. I, you know, obviously this isn't uh, I am an, a lawyer um, as well, but you know, obviously none of this is intended to be legal advice for anybody. Um, also, um, if I, I seem a little bit tired today, it's because I just had uh, welcomed a, a lovely newborn uh, little girl um, just last week. And so there's a quick picture of her sleeping yesterday. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, but you know, I'm hoping that she also learns this information as she um, grows and ends up uh, entering our school system. So, um, you know, the what I would like to do is start out. Uh, let me get here to start my slideshow. Uh, all right. So uh, presentation I'm going to uh, share with you all today is called Tribal Sovereignty uh, State Intersection. And uh, my name is Shane uh, A. Morjo. You just heard my my bio probably need to shorten that in the future for folks. Um, the, the, you already got my background. I, one thing I didn't mention in, in my bio is uh, I am a descendant of Chief Charlo. Uh, my grandmother was a Charlo. So, so my last name is Morjo on my um, dad's side. Uh, uh, my grandma was a Charlo. Uh, I was barred in 2011 and I started working in the executive office for the CSKT back in uh, just this last year, um, back in December. 
um, former criminal prosecutor and legal counsel for CSKT for over 10 years. Uh, before we get started, I do like to generally recognize, you know, the, the homelands of the CSKT. Um, our territory was known as Western Montana, parts of Idaho, uh, British Columbia, and, and parts of where Wyoming are now, um, ex exceeding over 20 million, million acres at the time of the 1855 Treaty of Hellgate. Um, I also like to share this video when I first start my, my presentation, because I think this gives people a pretty good idea. Um, you know, this is not, let me see if I can. Let's learn about government in the context of city, county, state, and federal. And of course, tribal governments are not part of that at all. Mr. President, you've been a governor and a president, so you have a unique experience looking at it from two directions. What do you think tribal sovereignty means in the, tri in the 21st century? And how do we resolve conflicts between tribes and the federal and state governments? Yeah. Uh, tribal sovereignty means that. It's sovereign. I mean, it's, you, you're a, you're a, you've been given sovereignty and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. Okay. And therefore, the relationship between the federal government and tribes is one between sovereign entities. Back to you, Shane. All righty. Well, thank you. So the point of that video is to just show you like even our, you know, even our top official in our country has a hard time uh, identifying what tribal sovereignty is. And that's actually a pretty tough question. And one of the things I, I look back at that, and, you know, I think, you know, do I wish he had a better understanding of the meaning of sovereignty with tribes? I do. But at the same time, one of the things that, that he understood was that tribes are sovereign nations and entities that have this relationship, the special relationship with the government. And so that was a, a, a good sign that our president understood that. But a lot of people are in that boat, right? In our country, they, um, they we generally, under, we hear that term, we think of it as like a separate, you know, entity that governs itself. Um, but for tribes, that, that's a, that can be a pretty loaded question. Um, and one that he probably should have done a little more research on. So what does, what does sovereignty really mean? Um, I'm going to go to, it's an inherent right and power to govern oneself. Uh, tri tribal sovereignty refers to the right of American Indians and Alaskan Natives to govern themselves. Uh, the U.S. Constitution has recognized that Indian tribes are distinct governments and that we have, with a few exceptions, the same powers as federal and state governments to regulate our internal affairs. So we have the right to establish our own form of government, to determine our membership requirements, um, you probably heard that at this point, that we, we set our own membership requirements. Um, we enact legislation and we establish law enforcement and court systems. Um, and the Constitution uh, gives authority in Indian affairs to the federal government, um, not to state governments. Just as the U.S. deals with states, it also deals with Indian tribes as, as governments, not special interest groups. Um, some states have explicitly recognized governmental status of Indian tribes. Montana has done that. Um, in, in some instances, uh, but Montana has also recognized tribes, um, tribes in our state constitution. So one of the things I like to do when I do these presentations is I like to talk about the policy eras. And these are pretty, you know, if you, if you want to go back and learn about these, uh, pretty, pretty well discussed in a lot of literature nowadays. Indian Law in a Nutshell is a great book that really breaks these down. Um, a lot of the, the resources that I'll, I'll share at the end, you can go find them. Um, in those places as well. But I think it's really important to understand the policy eras because I think it gives you a good understanding on um, who tribes are, what our sovereignty looks like and how we got there. Um, and also how that overlaps and how that intersects with the state of Montana. So establishment of the federal law. So in colonial times to 1820 tribes, we conduct our own affairs and we depended on no outside source of power to make us legitimate governments. Um, we acted on our own. Independently, uh, we were treated as sovereigns by the British Crown. We were le left to regulate our own affairs, which is uh, why when the colonies revolted, a lot of tribes actually allied with the Crown at the time because they had protected them from colonists. They had uh, recognized that tribes are these distinct entities and that they were left alone. So that's why you saw a lot of that 
um, why you saw tribes ally in, in some instances um, at that time. It, after the Declaration of Independence and July of 7, 4th of 1776, um, upon that in, independence, Congress determined that they were going to regulate commerce with Indian tribes. And the president was empowered to make treaties with consent of the Senate um, under the Constitution uh, that we, we developed this thing called the Trade and Intercourse Acts passed between 1790 and 1834, um, separating Indians and non-Indians and subjecting interactions to federal control. Uh, we also established boundaries um, and Indians protected um, ourselves from incursions by non-Indians. Um, one of the things that we saw was that non-Indians couldn't acquire Indian lands um, from them. Uh, federal crimes were established by non-Indians against Indian Indians as well. Um, Indian tribes were left to regulate our own conduct still. And on one hand, you had the Europeans claiming dominion over all of our territories of the New World, which would end up in a way limiting sovereignty or cloud sovereignty with tribal nations um, over time. Uh, that Those questions ended up being left with the U.S. Supreme Court. So a lot of these questions on, um, you know, what is the jurisdiction of tribes? What is uh, the land ownership of tribes? Because those things were just left up in the air, a lot of those uh, discussions um, were left to the U.S. Supreme Court. So the, the first case cases, and you may have heard about these already, um, but I think they're important to discuss are the Cherokee cases in Indian removal, which happened around 1820 to 1850. Um, these cases extinguish, were the extinguishment of Indian title to Eastern lands and removal of Indians beyond state boundary lines westward. So President Monroe, John Quincy Adams, and most vigorously, um, Andrew Jackson, um, uh, were the ones who really ushered in this, this movement of pushing Indians out um, westward, uh, also known as the Trail of Tears and removal of the Southeastern tribes to Oklahoma. Around 60,000 Cherokees were displaced and 4,000 died. I think that number has even been said to be much higher um, as well. Uh, friction at that time was primarily over demands for land. Um, and one want to go back really quick. A lot of times people, will, if you ever hear natives talk about, you know, why Andrew Jackson was one of the, 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 the least, um, one of the presidents we really dislike is because of his vigorous work to, to push Indians out and um, his actions and, and the results of how the fact that so many native people died at his hands. Um, the BIA at the time was under the War Department from 1824 to 1849 before moving to the Department of Interior. So that gave you a good sense of how Indians were looked at in this country. Simultaneously, uh, during this time of 1820 to 1850, the Supreme Court was developing legal doctrines for Indian law, um, which would ultimately help structure the future of tribal sovereignty, or I guess not structure in some instances, so I shouldn't always say help. Um, the next important case, I think, uh, or the, one of the main cases during that time was this case called Johnson v. McIntosh, um, where the Supreme Court said tribes can only grant lands to the federal government and exclusive title to those who discovered under what we call the doctrine of discovery, right? We had this this effort of manifest destiny, um, you know, the, the Christian, the Christians who found the land were, were entitled to it. And because Indians were considered heathens at the time, um, the doctrine of discovery was really used as a mechanism for the United States to displace Indians and to say, well, we're, we're the Christian nation that found these lands and these folks are heathens, So they don't really understand land ownership. So we had the right to occupy at the time, but the right to dispose of soil was to diminish. We couldn't sell um, the, any of the lands at the time. So Cherokee v. Georgia was another famous case, um, part of these cases called the Marshall Trilogies. Uh, the one that I just mentioned with Johnson v. McIntosh and Cherokee v. Georgia are both part of the Marshall Trilogies. In that case, the court said Cherokee was not regarded as a foreign state. Um, so they were no longer considered similar to what the crown considered us as like foreign nations. Um, but we were considered to be more like states under the Constitution. And so we were distinguished as political, political societies separated from others, managing our own affairs and governing ourselves. Um, and this is also the case that coined the, def, the term de domestic dependent nations. Wu Georgia was the last case in the Marshall Trilogies uh, where the Supreme Court 
stated that Indian nations had always been considered distinct, independent political communities, um, retain our own natural rights and undisputed possessors of the soil from time immemorial. So we had, with a single exception though, that um, imposed by your irresistible power, which excluded from intercourse with any European potentate that the first discover of the coast particular region claim. So what that really was doing was trying to, to eliminate the ability for tribes to uh, go into land transactions with uh, other European uh, states, the, the British crown or anyone else. So uh, the, they determined that the laws of Georgia in that particular case had no force in Cherokee territory. Uh, that limited sovereignty um, in, the, in the sense that conveyance of land and dealing with foreign powers, we were no, no longer considered to be, have that status as a foreign nation or a foreign power. And around this time, we, we saw the, the Trail of Tears happening um, and this de particular decision in Wooster v. Georgia, Andrew Jackson's response to the court at this time was um, that although uh, John Marshall had made his decisions. Now let now let him enforce it. And so um, this is in response to saying, you know, Georgia's laws um, have no force in Cherokee territory. So what ultimately happened is Andrew Jackson uh, took his own uh, own initiatives to force uh, the Cherokee Nation out um, through the Trail, trail of Tears. Uh, after that era, we see the Reservation Era in 1850 to 1887, and that was a uh, really, the treaty era was an attempt to assimilate and take the lands of tribal people. Uh, the Hellgate Treaty, which I'm most familiar with, uh, was signed at Council Grove State Park. Um, that particular treaty established a reservation of about 1.317 million acres, also known as the Jocko Treaty. Um, there were, as I mentioned earlier when I first started, there were over 20 million acres of Aboriginal territory that existed for the, the Salish and Kootenai people at that time. It was ratified. Um, in 1859, signed in 1855. Um, and actually one thing that, uh, keep hitting something here, apologies for that. Um, one of the things a lot of people don't know is under Article 11, there were actually supposed to be two reservations um, under the Treaty of Hellgate. The Bitterroot Valley was also to, to be surveyed and examined um, for a, a separate reservation for the Bitterroot Salish, which um, I descend from. And so uh, Chief Charlo said at that time that that's where our bones of our ancestors were buried. And that's why we have a connection uh, to the Bitterroot Valley to this day is because that's where a lot of our, that's where we were, were living at the time. Um, and actually went on to live there for many, many years before we were um, ultimately forced out um, at gunpoint. And so the, what we've been, one of the things that the treaty um, required was that they go and survey it to see um, if the president believed it was suitable for the, the, the Beirut Salish or the Indian people there. Um, what I've been told uh, by, by folks, um, by elders, is that um, what they simply did was just ride a, a horse around the actual Beirut area um, because they had never planned to, to actually honor that, uh, the Beirut Valley, the treaty in the Beirut um, or the reservation in the Beirut area. Uh, following years uh, uh, with Congress, they sent a delegation um, by President James Garfield to negotiate the removal of the Salish. Um, we refused, um, but simultaneously around this time, we had the Homestead Act um, being enacted in Montana in 1862, um, which had more competing interests for land. Um, Congress ended the treaty making era in 1871. Um, around this time, we also saw the, the era of boarding schools in 1878, um, off-reservation boarding schools. And after 1871, we saw the treaties were entered into via statute or by executive order only, um, which was ended by Congress in 1919. So this is kind of that, that era where we see reservations being, um, treaties being entered into or tribes being forced to enter into them. Um, not much of a choice for a lot of tribes um, and tribes being forced onto reservations so that we could free up more, uh, this country could free up more lands for, for people to be you know, go become agrarian farmers. Uh, the next era I think is really important is the allotment and assimilation era between 1887 and 1934. Um, the allotment era, uh, which was one of those eras that I, I think has had, we, we still experience damages um, from, from the allotment era, uh, which every single reservation in Montana uh, was impacted by the allotment era, um, except for, I believe, the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation. But Rocky Boy was founded in 1916, and I believe we're still impacted by this 
this this era of policy is because you can see the size of the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation. Obviously, um, the Chippewa Cree uh, had a much larger expansive territory than where they're located today. So they were, um, in my opinion, they experienced it just through that negotiation piece that uh, limited the size of their reservation. Um, so it, the allotment era, when it was passed, it broke up land bases for farmers, um, as I mentioned, uh, for disposition of excess lands. Um, after those treaties were um, negotiated, uh, we had the Allotment Act that basically took, took 160 acres to each head of family and 80 acres to others. Um, sometimes that was doubled for families if it was only suitable for grazing um, and divvied that out to tribal, those tribal families, those Indian families. Uh, and then the excess was typically the surplus uh, was sold off uh, to, at pennies on the dollar oftentimes. Um, during that time, it's estimated that around 138 million acres uh, between 1887, um, in 1887 uh, to 48 million in 1934 were lost. So around 90 million acres total is what they estimate uh, the tribal land bases being uh, taken from, from Indian people across this country. Um, in October of 1891, uh, the Bitterroot Salish were pushed out at gunpoint. And so, you know, I talked about the, the date of the Treaty of Hellgate, obviously, is 1855 to 1859. The Bitterroot Salish lived there until um, 1891. Um, so there was really almost this understanding that we were going to have the, the right and ability to stay there and live there. Um, but that was all came crumbling down when uh, we were forced out of our, our homeland there. Um, during this era, we also had court cases that said tribal powers are inherent. They're not derived from the federal government. Um, a, fa a famous case um, called Talton v. Mays um, in 1896 said the Bill of Rights that restrict the fe federal government do not apply to tribes. Uh, in 1904, the Allotment Act um, extended to CSKT um, and our land base went from actually 100% of the, the reservation um, as tribal ownership to under 30%. It's now roughly around 67%. Through that also every section 16 and 36 was removed as school, state school sections of each township, which I believe when I've looked online, um, some of the school materials that are, that are out there uh, reference that and discuss that as well. Um, between 1908 and 1909, uh, another 18,000, uh, almost 19,000 acres was carved out for the National Bison Range, which has been you know, fortunately restored back to the CSKT to our, our water settlement. Um, 3,000 lotteries were issued for homesteading, and then another 3,000 were issued in 1910 for homesteaders. Uh, remaining public lands were then opened for public sale, and around 400,000 acres of our original reservation were lost. Uh, 1920s had another round of uh, allotments with um, updated rolls and timber allotments that were 160 acres. Also, we had this a part of that was Flathead Villa Sites Act, which had five and 10 acre parcels along Flathead Lake where that were divvied out. So originally those weren't divvied out. And then people came in and said, hey, actually Flathead Lake's a pretty sweet spot. We, we might want some um, parcels on Flathead Lake, Lake as well. So those went under the allotment and then the surplus um, for a lot of people. So the, a lot of local people, um, their families have passed down obviously tracts of land along Flathead Lake, which are very valuable now. Um, but that was a product of a lot of those tracks were a product of the Allotment Act. Um, as I mentioned already, Rocky Boy was the only one not allotted. Um, in 1924, at the back end of the allotment and assimilation era, um, we got the right to, to, to tribal citizenship as long as um, I believe you were uh, uh, born in the United States. Uh, that came, also what came with that was state citizenship as US citizens. Um, you know, meanwhile, if you think about these eras, you know, World War One, you know, Native people were fighting in World War One. Native people were fighting in World War Two for our country. Um, in World War One, we still weren't. Uh, even after, you know, during that time frame of World War One, uh, we weren't citizens, but we we had um, natives fighting in, in war for this country. And actually, Native people um, uh, fight at a higher percentage per capita than any other uh, ethnic ethnicity in this country. So this is a, a really good map I like to show because this ultimately shows you the the land base of uh, what the Flathead uh, Nation reservation looked like uh, originally before uh, 1855, the green is our, our reservation. Um, this is what it looked like after allotments were divvied out to tribal members. Um, and then this is what it looked like after the allotment era, the surplus lands were all sold off. So the green is tribal lands 
um, and that's what it maintained as tribal lands. Uh, as, um, uh, you can see the areas around the perimeter is primarily and some scattered throughout the middle were um, still tribal lands. The orange in here is allotments. Um, you can see the water, homesteads are all in that tan color. The state school sections are that gray, um, those gray cubes throughout. Uh, the bison range that was carved out is that there in purple. Um, and so I think I saw a question in one of the, the, the emails that was sent over to me about people understanding the, the kind of the makeup of tribal land. So this is why that can be so confusing, right? Especially on reservations that have been heavily allotted. So um, today you still have, you still have some people um, with allotments. You have fee lands scattered uh, throughout the reservation, those state school sections. Um, state tri tribal lands, um, and then you have indi individual Indians who own uh, uh, land on the reservation. I, I for one, am uh, one of those individuals who has property and fee, um, so that wouldn't be accounted for in this like green color here. Um, we also have, uh, you know, back home we do a lot of, um, uh, we have home sites that the tribes will do. So uh, sometimes people will, uh, they'll have their own their own home site and fee property that they'll go and get a mortgage for to, to, to build a home. Um, and then other times the tribes will have certain areas of, of land where they offer those up as a home site for the tri for tribal members to be able to um, build a home there. Um, and then they'll enter into a lease with the tribes, but that property will typically be held by the tribes. Not all of the lands um, are held in, in trust. So you probably heard this term of trust status um, that's where basically the tribes own the 99 of the 100 bundle of sticks, um, except the, the interest is held in trust by the federal government for the tribes. So we'll oftentimes have federal or tribal properties held in trust status. Um, and then you'll also have individual tribal members who have um, land that, you know, they have acquired or was uh, um, bequeathed to them um, or they purchased and they'll put that into trust status as well. So it'll be in their name, um, but it'll be held in federal trust status uh, by the federal government. And why that exists, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of people about this very topic. And, you know, when the tribes, um, that's an option for tribes because the federal government recognized that when we entered into these treaties that we paid our taxes in perpetuity for these lands. So, you know, oftentimes if you ever, like I've heard people complain about that, um, but when you talk about the history and you talk about what, um, how this all transpired, it makes a lot more sense when you talk about what trust, trust lands and trust status means. Um, the Indian reorganization and preservation era um, is another era that I think is important. Um, that's when we had the Indian Reorganization Act, um, also known as the Wheeler Howard Act, that um, was really intended to protect land base and set up legal structures for gov the government. It ended that really horrific uh, allotment era. Um, constitutions and bylaws were, were structured by tribes, um, which also was known as self-government. Um, and Indian Reorganization um, Act constitutions were formed by a lot of tribes. Some tribes opted to, to develop their own constitution um, or, and then some tribes uh, used kind of the IRA uh, model in, in a sense. Uh, CSKT was the first tribe to submit a written constitution. Um, and the org chart and the types of folks and the programs um, and council um, have structured have built out basically, you know, our government. Um, and then we have obviously all of our departments and our programs, just like the state of Montana, that we're constantly trying to to run and organ or organize. Um, with one uh, one big major piece that we don't really have is um, the ability, uh, or we have a limited ability to really implement. Uh, uh, property taxes. So, and, and another piece of that too is that if we implemented property taxes on the reservation, we'd really be implementing taxes on um, primarily low-income uh, communities, which would actually just uh, further some of the the problems, that, social problems that we have on the reservation, um, where we have some of the highest unemployment, um, some of the the highest uh, um, uh, death rates. We die on average uh, around twenty years younger. Um, than our non-Indian counterparts. And so, you know, one of the things that tribes are really limited in being able to do is tax non-Indians. Um, it's very complicated. Actually, that would be its own presentation um, because that can get very complicated and complex, but uh, we have a limited, abil limited ability to tax. And then if we wanted to tax, we'd be ultimately taxing people um, that, you know, we shouldn't be taxing. So 
uh, tribes often try and diversify their portfolios and it go into business ventures um, to be able to raise additional funds um, in conjunction with uh, any federal type of funding or grants that they get um, to uh, provide uh, services to the tribal members and uh, to keep programs running. Uh, the termination and relocation era um, was between 1953 and 1968, um, where we enacted laws to terminate the, the government's trusteeship of Indian laws and relocate Indians to nations, um, Indians to the nation's cities. So um, this is an era where the federal government was like, look, we, we want to make, um, you know, we want to terminate this relationship with Indian tribes, um, relocate them to places. Uh, yeah, I had a family member who was relocated to, to a city, to Seattle, actually, um, who ended up going and working for a company. But ultimately, you know, that, that's pretty problematic as well, right? Because we were relocating people from their communities, from our culture, from, from people who should be helping uh, perpetuate our culture and our languages um, were being relocated. And then we had the, simultaneously the government terminating relationships with, with various tribes across the country. Um, the intent was to make uh, state citizens only subject to, to state law. Um, lands were um, to be converted into private ownership in most instances, um, they were sold. Uh, tribes actually plunged more into deep economic troubles during this time, um, even though the intent was to try and like do the opposite. Um, a lot of tribes plunged into deep, deep economic troubles um, that were a product of the termination era. Uh, public law 280 was also during the, this era, which diminished the role um, sovereignty of tribes um, their ability to govern themselves and subjected them to, to state criminal and civil laws. Um, there were some mandatory states that I've listed here, and then there were a lot of uh, tribes that were optional. Um, the CSKT is the only uh, reservation in Montana that um, has public law 280, um, and actually the tribes had requested that because at the time we had one, um, one or two law enforcement officers covering the entire Flathead Indian Reservation and so they really needed help to help manage um, the tribal resources and the law enforcement on the reservation. Um, so CSKT has had consented to um, later on consented to being a optional one of those optional states and still is to this day um, where the state of Montana has criminal um, felony jurisdiction on the Flathead Indian Reservation, um, whereas the tribes um, prosecute criminal offenses and have civil regulatory jurisdiction over many things, including clean water, clean air, um, and those sorts of things. Um, around this time, uh, we had the Voting Rights Act of 1965 passed at the back end of the termination and relocation era as well. So obviously there was a lot of uh, voter suppression happening throughout the country. Um, even after the voter Voting Rights Act of 65, there was still a lot of voter suppression and um, Obviously, my belief is that there is much voter suppression happening still to this day, um, but obviously it got a lot better after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 um, to help strengthen uh, voter protection for uh, specifically, more specifically, minority people in this country. Um, the next era I think is um, really worth the back end of the, the eras that I want to mention is the self-determination era, which um, from was between 1968 to our current time. Um, this, again, I mentioned uh, the Indian Civil Rights Act um, or the Voting Rights Act was right before this. Then we entered the Indian Civil Rights Act um, of 1968, which imposed the Bill of Rights on tribes and it amended Public Law 280 to where states could not assume criminal or civil jurisdiction without tribal consent. So, you know, I mentioned that PL 280 um, uh, Act, you know, having mandatory and then some p states could opt in at options. This changed it to where a tribe had to consent to that jurisdiction. Um, the termination policy, policies from what I just mentioned were declared a failure by President Nixon, um, who came up with really some great policies for, for local control. In my opinion, uh, President Nixon was, was honestly one of the better uh, presidents that we, we've had as far as relationships with tribes and, and tribal governments. Uh, in 1975, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act was passed, which allowed tribes to uh, contract programs for, for federal Indian programs um, and compact programs. So there is, there is a difference between contracting and compacting. Um, a lot of it has to do with how the, the money is held. So like contracting tribes uh, typically have to go, every time they need to do something, they'll oftentimes have to uh, pull, have money pulled out of those programs. 
whereas compacting programs gives tribes a lot more autonomy and control over the monies um, and allows them to utilize those funds, um, transition those funds around for, for other needs as well. So contracting can be uh, um, a little bit more difficult, although it's an, a really a big step in the right direction for um, tribal sovereignty, for tribes having uh, their own autonomy to run their programs. Um, it's just more direct to a very a particular program and how money can be spent for those compacting programs has just more flexibility. Um, and so why were the feds running programs on the reservation and why did we have to go through this process? Um, again, this goes back to the history that the federal government reserved unto itself the right to work with tribes directly and primarily in context and um, getting tribes to relinquish our lands. Uh, part of that process, the, the U.S. deals with tribes and part of the land transactions were by coercion and force by the U.S. But the U.S. made commitments to provide certain services underlying, um, they entered into those underlying agreements um, that require ongoing perpetual contributions uh, for those vast amounts of lands that made up the U.S. So a lot of those government programs on reservations, uh, sadly, during that time turned into a system of, of patronage. So you know, we saw these programs um, get up and running under the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs or different programs. But what we saw is a lot of those programs became for the federal government that made those commitments turned into a patronage system where those Indian agents would uh, essentially use those, those avenues to uh, become wealthy. Um, and so uh, they had unlimited authority on decisions and the system grew to allow them to really take a cut of, of things. And so, you know, you may have heard of the Cobell settlement, which um, obviously has, has recognized some of this, um, this wrongdoing over time. Uh, but nowadays, uh, tribes, a lot of tribes are now um, going into Indian self-determination, contracted and compacted programs. Um, who is better suited to run their own affairs than the people who know their issues and um, know their own membership, um, their membership's needs? So the self-determination continued again. I think it's worth mentioning a couple of the notable cases. Uh, U.S. v. Majuri, um was a case where the self-governing character tribes um, has enabled Congress to delegate power to them and that could not be delegated to a non-governmental private association. So the U.S. Supreme Court upheld um, federal law to prohibit, prohibit liquor in Indian country unless the tribe permitted it. So that to me was a, a really strengthening tribes Tri the tribal sovereignty and being able to have some regulatory um, strengthening in that tribal regulatory jurisdiction. Um, U.S. v. Wheeler is another case at the time where there was no Fifth Amendment violation of double jeopardy as an independent sovereign. Again, recognizing that we have our own jurisdiction. One person could be tried in um, a tribal court and could also be tried in another court. And um, that is still the case today. Although obviously we recognize that, you know, charging somebody and tribal court and in um, state court, for example, with CSKT, wouldn't make a lot of sense if somebody's in there for a felony, um, say it's a felony DUI or something, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for CSKT to then go and say, well, we're going to charge you also again for a DUI. It, 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 it just, you know, we just don't do that. It's just, it's the wrong direction to treat um, those, those particular issues in our communities. Um, and Another case that, the, uh, that I think is worth mentioning through this era is National Farmers Union, which was um, uh, an order uh, pushed out in 1985 where um, the federal government said the relevant inquiry is if there's a federal limitation to pre prevent the tribes from acting within the sphere of sovereignty, not whether authority permits the tribes to act. So they're saying they have to, they look at whether or not there's specific, specifically something preventing or specifying whether a tribe can act um, within the sphere of sovereignty for a particular thing, um, not whether um, they have to permit it. So um, tribe, what hasn't been taken away essentially remains. So during this case, they also said, you know, when you look at a case with tribes, this is why Indian law can be so complicated sometimes is because you have to examine statutes, treaties, executive policies, administrative policies, and judicial decisions. Um, and so obviously that can take a lot of work and a lot of research um, in, in order to find out um, and navigate uh, federal Indian law. Um, Self-determination again, continued uh, to where we are now. Um, ushering in, uh, we had between this era, something we, we call government to government relations um, with tribal governments. President Clinton in 1994 issued a memorandum 
um, for each agency to act in government to government relationships with tribes. Um, that's been continued by each president since then. Uh, the government to government executive order requiring federal consultation. I put it in there if you ever are curious and you wanna go look at it. Um, but they've also determined that federal cons consultation with tribes um, requires it to be meaningful consultation. So it can't just be sending an email or something it actually has to be meaningful. So there's been case law and discussions on what qualifies as meaningful. Mon Montana also has something to um, consult with tribes as well. And to, uh, uh, if you ever go look at a bill that's passed in Montana, it always have something on there saying they've sent the bill out to tribes to notify them because Montana has recognized that um, we have these um, separate sovereignties within the state of Montana and that some of these uh, the laws in Montana um, may impact uh, Indian people who are also state citizens, uh, tribal citizens, and U.S. citizens. Um, and I also put in there just the current memorandum reaffirming that executive order by President Biden. Um, some notable plenary power cases. Uh, this is just a discussion on like the plenary power of, of, of Congress over Indians. Um, they really are the ones who have that plenary power over Indian affairs in, in our country is a case called U.S. v. Lara, um, uh, another case called U.S. v. Long, which said deemed to arise from the Indian Commerce Clause and the Treaty Clause. And again, some examples of, of plenary power um, that I mentioned um, earlier was Public Law 280, the Civil Rights Act, where they've implemented these laws that specifically say this is uh, we're going to impose these restraints on the Bill of Rights on tribes or this particular uh, civil or criminal jurisdiction. Um, we also had the Major Crimes Act uh, passed in 18, um, or Major Crimes Act, 18 USCA 1153, which um, created punishment for members uh, for crimes in Indian country. So compacting and contracting today, uh, and to me, this is a means to tribal sovereignty. What do they mean? Uh, Self-governance, again, can reprogram. I mentioned this earlier. Um, they can reprogram to meet the tribe's needs. Um, in my opinion, compact, compacting is more respectful and allows for changes um, if tribes need. Contracting is more specific, as I mentioned, to a program or a particular need. Um, they disperse as they would to a program. Um, uh, so example is like Mission Valley Power back home um, is um, actually a contracted program. So they have to, every time they need funds released, for example, for like payroll, they have to go and request that those funds be released, um, which can obviously create um, problems sometimes if those funds don't get released as quick as they probably should. Um, contracts, there, there needs to be separate contracts for each program, um, and there's less ability to redesign those programs um, that I mentioned um, as far as like compacting. You can streamline, um, be more flexible and move and redesign things a little bit. So some examples at CSKT, of some programs that are, are compacted as Indian Health Services, our Tribal Lands Program, our Forestry Program uh, is contracted, our Mission Valley Power Program is contracted, and so is our uh, Two Eagle River School uh, Program. Not all of Forestry, I believe, is, is contracted, but a portion of that um, it actually is. So the Tribal Sovereignty and, and State Intersection, and so how does this all connect, and why can things be um, so complicated. Um, after the allotment and assimilation era for CSKT, our population on the Flathead Indian Reservation of non-Indians is around 80%. 70% is, 70% uh, of the, the land is CSKT is roughly around there as CSKT's um, land today. So we went from that allotment era to where it was like right around 30%. Um, the tribes have made it, went under or undergone um, efforts to do buybacks and repurchase and restore lands. So we're back to 70, around 70%, but our population as a result of allotment eras and those policies we went through um, is now, uh, has the reservation population sitting at around 80% non-Indians. Um, I think around 30,000, just over 30,000 total uh, residents um, on the Flathead Indian Reservation. So citizenship also can be confusing. And, and when I, I've worked um, in the legislature or just my work throughout Montana, a lot of people I think have a hard time connecting like the fact that like me as a, a member of the Salish Kootenai tribes, that I'm a member of the tribes, that I'm a state citizen and I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, you know, I talked about that uh, the U.S. Citizenship Act uh, since 1920, 1924, all Indians born in the U.S. or born to citizens outside of the country are U.S. citizens 
with all of the attendant rights and responsibilities. Um, that came with that came state citizenship. Um, and before all of that, uh, treaties or allotment acts extended citizenship to individual Indians and members of only certain Indian tribes. Um, so Indians are citizens, as I mentioned, of, of uh, the U.S. Our tribes and, and the state of Montana. Um, and U.S. citizenship is not inconsistent with tribal membership, nor does it actually affect the special relationship that exists between Indian tribes and the federal government. Uh, tribal sovereignty and, and state intersection, again, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap now because of this history in our country, right, um, and in our state. The, the history created these overlapping jurisdictions, um, these citizenships and, and complex issues, right? We have, like on the Flathead Indian Reservation, we have counties, um, we have, you know, cities, and we have the tribes, we have the U.S. properties, uh, uh, U.S. government, um, and then we have the state of Montana. Um, you remember the state school sections we talked about, you have state school sections there, you have taxation issues, um, you know, limited taxing authority uh, really left tribes again to diversify um, our portfolios, um, because it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to often tax low income and small populations. Um, taxing small populations of people isn't going to uh, really give us the means to uh, be able to run a lot of the, the program. So uh, tribes have to be really um, uh, think outside the box to to diversify their portfolios to provide and um, provide for their, their membership and for all the needs of all their programs. Um, we also have in Montana a lot of revenue sharing agreements because of this complicated taxation, these complicated taxation issues for like um, alcohol or fuel tax. Um, those things can, can uh, create complex areas of law. And so to kind of um, develop better relationships in the work with tribes. Montana has entered into a lot of these taxation um, revenue sharing agreements for taxation um, on Indian reservations. Um, obviously, the education system is extremely important to it's the great equalizer, in my opinion. Um, as many of you have heard that that phrase, I'm sure many, many times, I truly believe that, um, you know, that citizenship for for Indian students is is critical in our school systems. Um, we depend on the school systems that that you all are a part of. Um, and uh, most, most of our, our children attend our, our public school systems um, in the state, which is why so many, uh, there, there's so much overlap. This is just one example, of course. That's why a lot of times you'll see a lot of concern and advocacy for, for state funding uh, for various programs because a lot of our Indian kids, uh, most of our Indian kids go to our school systems. And so we have to make sure that those are funded in a way that um, fund their educational needs to set, set them up for success. Um, there are a couple, two tribally controlled grant schools in Montana, one on Northern Cheyenne and one on the Playa Indian Reservation. Um, this is a, 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 a contracted, um, they receive some funds from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to help run that school. It's a, a smaller school, um, but it, it does offer an opportunity for a little more intimate educational opportunity for our, um, some of our tribal members. And it also does um, offer educational opportunities on average to about 35 non-Indian students um, at that school as well on the Indian on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Um, I'll end it with uh, these helpful resources. Um, these are just obviously some that you can go take a look at um, if you if you're curious um, and would like to know more. Um, the the ledge.mt.gov one is uh, is a really good resource. I believe Jennifer is going to share this with you all. Um, the IndianLaw.mt.gov has a really good, uh, some really good information. Turtle Talk blog is a great place for, for looking at case law. Um, NCAI, NARF, um, and Montana Budget uh, all have really good resources on like, you know, taxation and, uh, you know, federal resources and um, uh, treaties and that sort of thing. Anything your heart desires, you can go look. And then the NCSL.org um, website also has some really good information out there on tribes. Um, within uh, the NCSL network um, that states are, are typically a part of. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, and my ears are burning. So that means I'm guessing there's probably gonna be a few questions and I haven't even looked in the chat here. So uh, I wanna say thank you all for taking the time to um, listen to me uh, talk at length and for opening your minds open, keep your minds open to learning to, to be um, just better people and better educators. Awesome, Shane. Wow, that was 
That was a lot. So I, I have some questions and there are some questions that came up um, in the chat. So I think we'll have time for, for all of them. Um, I, I personally want to know more about your experience with the, the water compact and the bison range, um, particularly since um, we have a new uh, Department of Interior secretary who is keen on uh, Indian issues as she is the first native to um, be in that position, which is monumental, considering we've talked so much about lands, we've talked so much about, you know, um, land rights. And, and I do have some more some more questions um, for on land as well. But can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with the water compact and the bison range? Oh, I think let me uh, let me unmute myself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I um, first set out and worked in the legislature starting back in 2013 um, on the water compact and then in 15. Um, and then ultimately in 17 um, as well. And so um, was there advocating for that um, on behalf of the Salish and Kootenai tribes um, before getting elected to, to serve in the legislature um, and, and uh, getting that passed actually in 2015 in Montana. We still have, uh, Montana still has a, a state contribution to, to make to um, uh, really help us there's a few things that need to still happen before the actually tribes, the CSKT can access some of the funds um, in our water settlement. One of those um, things is we've got to quantify the hungry horse um, water right. Uh, also, we need to, um, the state needs to fund. There are roughly uh, $45, $5 million uh, that's still outstanding, which is also actually supposed to go primarily to um, uh, the irrigation system improvements, the pumping plant, um, which actually will primarily, uh, it helps the tribes because it really helps strengthen our fisheries. But at the same time, um, it really helps a lot of the non-Indian irrigators on the Flyhead Indian Reservation um, because those improvements will really uh, improve uh, the capacity and amount of water that they can get access to. So, um, uh, so I worked on that, it was super excited. Um, when the, the compact passed in Montana, I think I went and did karaoke that night or something. Um, there was like three of us uh, uh, dancing the night away, but it was still, it was like a Tuesday or something like that, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, and then we, uh, we were able to, it's very surprisingly, I thought it would take my lifetime, honestly, to, to get it passed through Congress. Um, but we were able to get our, our settlement passed through Congress uh, with, you know, sometimes things just the pieces fall you know, in place. And, and we were able to um, jump on a train that was able to kind of usher that through. Um, and that said, we, we do have uh, for rehab and, um, and betterment and some uh, work on some uh, improvements on some of the waterways. We are able to access some of the funds for that, but most of the funds are locked up until uh, some of these things are finalized, such as like the state, uh, the state contribution to the, the water settlement that the state committed to. Uh, the bison range was part of that. Uh, water settlement package um, at the at Congress, uh, which I was fortunate to be able to be a part of and work on. Um, and we had a wonderful celebration this last this year. Feels like it happened two years ago because this is, you know, having, you know, getting the compact passed, you know, and then the, the bison range restored and, um, you know, all of these things happened. We had the bridge uh, named after in Missoula, the former Higgins Street Bridge in barrier tracks this year. It's just been a really great year uh, for CSKT. And then throwing a, having a kid last week, it's been a, you know, <laughs> it's been a crazy fun year, but, um, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready to, it's been exciting, but ready for 2023. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're really, you know, the, the bison range has obviously always uh, been, been a part of the heart, right in the heart of the reservation. Uh, Big Medicine uh, was located at the bison range, which um, we were actually just, uh, uh, the Montana Historical Society so graciously worked with me and on um, the CSKT to to return Big Medicine as well. So yeah, can you can a, you share with us who Big Medicine is? I'm not sure everyone will know who who he is. Yeah, Big Medicine's a, a true white buffalo, not an albino buffalo, um, born in uh, gosh, he was 60, um, passed away in 1962, um, but he was a a, a white buffalo. Uh, that had real spiritual significance to CSKT, um, who was born at the um, 
at the National Bison Range that formerly known as the National Bison Range. Right now it's um, known as the just the Bison Range. Um, and so uh, when he was born, it was kind of at a time where um, the we were going through, uh, you know, we we're going some through some of these eras that I just talked about. You know, we 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 were, um, I think we we're also in the Great Depression at the time, um, and so when he he was born, it was really this this moment for for CSKT, um, you know, to celebrate because uh, he he was a for some of us he he represented the centralizing of the the, the spiritual power of the buffalo. Of course, uh, white buffalo bison have different meanings for different tribes. Um, but for CSKT, he had obviously significant cultural meaning to us and, and, and um, get, brought a lot of, um, he brought hope to a lot of people at the time. And so um, he was, uh, when he passed away, he was uh, mounted and sent to the Montana Historical Society where he, he sat since um, his death, I believe in um, 1962, if I remember right. Um, uh, he died in 1959. So, um, and he was 26 years old. So, um, you know, he had that real, he's just, for us, it just was like a piece missing, uh, you know, we had the land restored, uh, that was taken from us. We had a, you know, significant, um, creature that, you know, was, had significant cultural meaning to us, um, taken from us. And so bringing it all full circle really allows us to continue to heal, um, through, some of the damages that were, were done through some of those policies and those errors that I discussed with you all today. So, um, so that was a, you know, uh, for us, you know, for some people getting a, a mounted bison might not be that important to them, but for us, you know, it was a, a, you know, a day where everybody back home was celebrating because we finally brought him home. Um, he's not home yet, but he came with us that day. I believe um, we're still working through the logistics on, on when that all happened to get him back from, um, MHS, but they have committed um, and committed to returning him. I've signed, you know, formally signed to, to return him. It's just a matter of when uh, we can kind of figure out the logistics to get him back, back home. You know, something that you said reminded me, you know, we had Wes Martell uh, from the Shoshone and Arapaho tribes on, uh, on Tuesday evening. And um, he talked a lot about there being two different tribes. And of course, there's, you know, the Confederated Salish and the Kootenai tribes. Can you talk a little bit about how how the government works for, for your two tribes together? Yeah, I mean, well, there's actually three three tribes, uh, the Bitterroot Salish, um, uh, the Kalispell, uh, or Ponderays people, the Klispe, um, and then the Sanka, the Kootenai. Um, so we have three tribes on the Flyhead Indian Reservation, Salish and um, uh, Cleese Bay are very similar in language. And so those cultural committees and a lot of the, um, cultural activities can be, uh, similar. Um, not everything is of course, but, um, uh, many similarities in a lot of ways. And so our cultural committee is, um, called the Salish Cleese Bay cultural committee, um, SQCC, um, which if you ever want to learn, uh, there's a lot of great materials on CSKT's website on the CS, the, the SQCC's, um, page. So if you're ever looking for materials or information um, for any work you're doing, um, you can go and look on their website or you can call them. They're extremely, um, they're all wonderful, great people that work. They're very knowledgeable. I call them all the time. In fact, I've learned to kind of check in with them over my career so that I don't get things uh, mixed up or wrong, right? So, um, and then we obviously have the the, the Sanka, um, the Kootenai, um, who are the everywhere on the reservation, but a lot of the, the, the community is located up north of Flathead Lake um, on that side. So, um, and, you know, they just, they took three tribes that were generally, you know, I mentioned the Bitterroot Salish, we were in the Bitterroot, right? Um, and then you had the, uh, the Cleese Bay, the uh, Kalispell were generally in the area, and then also the, the Kootenai were um, north in the area as well. And so they took the three tribes and shoved us all onto a reservation um, together. And that do you said, have different tribal councils, or are you all together united in a tribal council? Nope we have um, we have one tribal council, um, and like for me, for example, I'm I'm actually Salish and Kootenai. Um, uh, a lot of people are nowadays, but um, we, uh, um, or many people are uh, nowadays uh, after living together so long, right? Um, 
but we have one council that's represented, you know, the, the member tribal members from, you know, whatever you're, you're if you're a real tribal member, whatever community um, you live in, you're eligible, obviously with certain criteria and age requirements and stuff like that. Um, uh, you can run for tribal council, but we have 10 council members um, that currently represent uh, CSKT in their four year terms and they are staggered. And does CSKT have a tribal constitution? We do. Um, yep, we do have a tribal constitution. Um, okay. And that yeah. that as well can be, um, um, you can just go to like the CSKT website and you can go to the tribal, uh, the government tab and you can go on there and, and see the, uh, find the CSKT uh, constitution as well. Um, I oh. believe it's also located in our tribal ordinances, like they have put it into the ordinance. And all of the resources that Shane is talking about, uh, and if there's any extra ones, I'll make sure to add that to the resource page. Um, do There's a couple of uh, land questions. Um, do tribes have the right to independently produce and market their own natural resources, oil, gas, coal, timber on their reservations? And related to that then, Biden is shutting down drilling for oil on a lot of federal land. Can he shut down drilling on Indian land? So kind of a two-part question there. Um, well. I think, I think tribes have retained. It depends on the the type of land that it is. I, I think, um, you know, and what. So that that can be. You know, I'm in my mind right now. I'm going through. I used to do land transactions, so I used to do leases and that sort of thing. And a lot of times, if we had lands, um, um, you know, we have a lot of checkerboarded or fractionated interests uh, on on Indian reservations too, because a lot of times when. Um, individuals passed away, their lands would end up to multiple individuals. And so over time, um, that, that's created a situation where um, certain individuals might have, uh, you know, mineral rights uh, that are held with certain people, or those mineral rights are all fractionated with various owners for both surface and mineral. Um, typically, uh, the tribal, uh, the tribal lands that are held, whether they're held in fee or, or trust status, um, the tribes retain those mineral rights on those lands. So um, yeah, they, they um, you simply just held by the US, the US government um, uh, in trust status for tribes. So, you know, the, the intent there is that tribes are, you know, have the 99 bundle of you know, sticks in the 100, you know, the bundle of 100 sticks and have the ability to utilize those, those lands as a um, see fit and to manage them. Um, of course, there, there can be, there's like a process for, you know, this is a whole, whole world of, of law, right? There's, uh, administrative processes, um, uh, code of federal re regulations, as far as like, um, how certain processes or what, um, can be done with, with, uh, tribal lands, how someone can, um, or what the process is for keeping them in trust status, um, getting them into uh, trust status, they can't have certain types of, uh, like, if you want to put something in trust, typically they have to be um, in a place where they um, they can't be contaminated, um, those sorts of things. So, um, but my my opinion would be, you know, that tribes should should and do have the right to do what they want with their, their land and resources. That said, you know, um, you know, I'm not speaking for for all tribes on here by any means. You know, different tribes have in Montana have um, done different things with their lands um, for for revenue to provide for their people. You know, you might go to Eastern Montana, um, and Crow uh, might do one thing. You know, or you go to um, you know uh, CSKT or Blackfeet, and you know we view that differently, right? Um, of course, our our economic drivers in this area often are. Um, driven by tourism in a lot of ways, right? It's a, it's a hub for Glacier National Park, um, natural resources, the lakes. Um, people come over here and they, they come over to our area because they really wanna recreate. So, you know, a lot of, uh, um, with that, that said, CSKT has experienced um, some pretty major impacts to our, our tribal lands because of tourism and, and those um, economic impacts. And so, um, we've tried to be more mindful about protecting our natural resources um, so that we're protecting them in perpetuity, um, the wildlife and all the resources that come along with those um, so that um, they're, you know, they're healthy. Uh, so, yeah, you know, different tribes are doing, you know, doing different things. And, um, 
their lands, um, whether they're holding lands in fee in fee or they have put things in the trust um, is very different from tribe to tribe. Some tribes have more and um, are more checkerboarded than others. Um, but yeah, I, it'd probably be a whole presentation on its own to go through land tribal, um, you know, the processes for, for, you know, the tribal lands programs for mm -hmm. land, like leases and um, certain types of transactions, right? Like, um, for example, CSKT does a lot of leases for agriculture um, on our tribal lands for um, a lot of non-members actually get leases from the tribes to graze cattle, for example. So um, CSKT will, will manage that process, but there oftentimes will be an approval process um, for certain types of leases that go up the chain through, through the BIA, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, because we, although we are running that program, it's still a federal program. So I think this this question is uh, quite germane to the conversation. Some of the red tape and hoops tribal members have to go through for property ownership transfer sales almost seems prejudicial when you compare the same type of transaction to non-Native American people. Are some of these land categories actually holding some Indian people back from the freedoms that non-Indian people enjoy? Um, well, it... it... Yes and no. You know, I think, um, you know, there, if, if a tribal member, in my opinion, you know, one of the things, one of the benefits, right. Um, and actually, I don't even think I, I should be very careful about saying that because I don't think it's a benefit. I believe if a tribal member puts, decides if I'm a tribal member, I own fee land on the flight Indian reservation, right. Um, I have a, a chunk of property in Ronan area. If I wanted to take that and put it in a trust status, individual trust status, I could. Um, I think that is something that as a, as an Indian person who, you know, is a descendant of the treaty that we entered into, that's my, my right to say, Hey, I want to, I want to be in a place where I'm not, um, I don't believe I, because our people pay our property taxes in per perpetuity or this concept of property taxes, I should say. Um, it's my right to, to make that decision whether or not I want to put it into trust status or not. Um, because, uh, we as Salish and uh, Cleese Bay uh, Kootenai people have paid our, our those uh, so-called taxes in perpetuity. I could leave it in fee land or fee status as well, which it currently is, right? Um, but in order to, if I wanted to put it into trust and then take it out of trust, I would only be able to do that once. Um, and also um, it does create a little bit more of um, processes to, like if I put it in the trust status and then I wanted to sell it, They'd have to go through a process to be um, taken out of that because only certain individuals can ho hold that property and trust status. So, in, in a in a sense, yeah, it does it does create um, more problems. And there's probably a school of thought on that that you know we shouldn't have to do that at all. Um, and I, I would definitely you know uh, I can see that perspective for sure. Um, uh, but I also think we also have a, a some of these processes processes exist too because a lot of native people were taken advantage of. Um, and an example of you know when I was talking about uh, during the allotment act period, um, uh, there was rumors that I've been told back home is that some tribal members um, during the allotment act period actually lost um, a lot of the uh, so the mercantile in Missoula, for example, is kind of a, for for us is kind of a controversial thing because. The mercantile was actually used as a means to uh, put Indian people into debt when they had allotment um, allotments divvied out to them during the allotment era. And then a lot of tribal members who went into debt couldn't afford to pay the taxes on those. And so they had to sell off, um, sell those, or the, the, the mercantile would just take the, um, the deeds to those properties, right? And so a lot of members uh, lost their, their properties because they had to get food. You know, um, I've also heard of stories where tribal members were at war during that time period. And because they were gone, they didn't know they had to, um, they didn't have the ability to pay the property taxes. And so the, the property was, um, you know, sold off. So, you know, there's some processes in place um, to also prevent people from, um, I think, taking advantage of, of uh, Indian people. Uh, unfortunately, some of that process has uh, being taken advantage of is obviously through those processes, especially during the Indian agents 
um, the work through Indian agents over the years, a lot of tribes have been taken through the, the people who are supposed to be acting as trustees for us. So um, one hand, yes, I think it would be much, there's definitely an argument that there are a lot of hoops and it does make it more difficult. On the other hand, um, you can argue that there's processes in, in, in a lot of in a lot of forms nowadays because of some of these um, inequities. So to clarify, can a non-native person buy land on the reservation from a tribal member or the tribe? Um, can a, a non-native person? Yeah, I mean, if I wanted to sell, I have fee property. Um, I could sell that to somebody uh, right now. I'm not trying to sell anybody any land right now. <laughs> um, just disclaimer, but if, if, if I wanted to, I could. Um, Obviously, it's it's going to be subject to you know um, you know whatever the if you're wanting to go out and divvy up parcels and stuff, it's going to be subject to various types of zoning um, in, in certain circumstances. Um, but also, uh, if I owned it in an in individual trust status, I could I could um, process that in a way where I could sell it to somebody. It would just have to go through a process to where it gets transitioned back out of trust into fee, which is um, of course. Uh, some hoops to jump through, um, as was mentioned in one of the other questions. Um, and then the tribes own the status of, of um, their lands and, and trust status. Uh, I, a lot of times in trust status, but a lot of tribes have properties and fee. And so they'd have to go through uh, similar processes. I just have never, honestly, I think um, I've never heard of, I mean, and I, I haven't heard of it. It doesn't mean it's never happened, but I think most of the time tribes are trying to, um, you know, retain or, uh, you know, purchase back, do land back, um, you know, buybacks because of the, the detrimental impacts of those policies on tribes. So I, I typically don't think that's um, something that, you know, tribes do because they're looking to for the best interest of their memberships and, and should be. And I think part of that process is to, you know, acquire, have those resources and um, those lands for the membership, um, as was agreed uh, agreed on in many of the treaties that we entered into. So um, that said, I don't speak for all tribes. That's just my own personal opinion. Thank you for that. So I believe you know former Senator Whitford. She's with us tonight and she gave us a wonderful presentation. And she also talked about the the debt, you know, and um and the allotments and you know how that kind of cornered um some tribal members into relinquishing their their land. Um, but she also talked about uh encouraging, you know, teachers to talk about um becoming, you know, civil servants and, and, and becoming, you know, using their voice to represent um, people. And so in that vein, we have a wonderful question. Um, could you please share your thoughts on the importance of Indigenous representation within different governmental agencies and how you think your experiences have helped shift those of others to consider new perspectives? Yeah, um, well, if you ever want to learn my perspective on this, you can go watch the um, recording um, at the law school that they did. Um, they did a bunch of uh, some panels on the, the state's constitution through the law review there. Um, and I sat on a panel where we discussed this because there was no, um, there was no native delegate as part of the constitutional convention in the 1970s. And so uh, it was at 71 or 72 um, when the, the convention convened. But um, it didn't have native representation. I will say that the constitution does a good job in, in some ways of, you know, obviously re recognizing the distinct cultural um, uh, you know, heritage of, of Montana tribes and uh, making a commitment to protect that. Um, there's also, you know, the constitution does a good job of recognizing that, you know, we have tribes and that these other separate um, nations in our state and to, to really foster good positive relationships with each other. Um, that said, though, it, it doesn't replace the fact that um, that representation was missing because I think things would look a lot different if there was Indian representation um, at that uh, at that conference um, or that convention. Um, so I think it's the same um, across the, the the board for everything we do, right? I think um, you know when we talk about like that representation and the, the perspectives we have, you know, that's um, the way we we think the way we're wherever we all come from right like you know i, I know everybody um, comes from different backgrounds and you all have important perspectives and and um your backgrounds influence the way you see the world um and the way you you interact with kids and in, in our educational system um 
And I think that does matter, right? I think that having that, um, those perspectives without a doubt uh, plays a role in, in um, you know, uh, how we see people. Um, and I think, uh, you know, an example for me was when I was in elementary school, one of the, actually the few things I remember about being um, an Indian kid in the Ronan school system was when we had a language class for like two weeks that came and taught Salish. It might've been like a, a month where they came in like once a week. That's like one of the main things that I remember as a, a native kid going to in our, in our school system when I was in elementary school was that the being in that class and seeing those people teach those classes, even though it was very short lived um, is something I remember more than pretty much anything else. Um, so, you know, I think it's not only important just for bringing those those unique perspectives into the fold of uh, the way we, we see the world. Um, but I think it's also important for our, our youth for empowering them. I love that. I love that. Are you um, are you willing to zoom into classrooms and and, you know, or if you have time, because I know you're going to be very, very busy um, coming up here with the, it being a session year. But are you are you willing to talk to classes about your experiences and well, I did a presentation similar to this to some elementary students, and I realized I was, um, it was, <laughs> I had to dial it down next, the next time I do it. Um, you know, it was probably a good presentation for high school kids, uh, but, you know, I think when I, I had one kid uh, lick the screen at one point, you know, I think, you know, I think that was probably a good tell that my presentation was, you know, I got asked to talk about tribal sovereignty to elementary kids. I, I still, I have not done it again. I think I'd have to really rethink how I do that because I think tribal sovereignty is, you know, when we talk about the subject, it is pretty, um, it is an in-depth topic that, you know, you could spend even a lot more time than I, like I just breeze through a lot of things and a lot of the, the, the case law. Um, you know, I think there's a question in here on, you know, some of the new case cases that have came down, um, you know, and so I think obviously, um, there, Indian law is often being shaped by the Supreme Court. And, you know, I think there's some things in that recent Oklahoma case, um, when we talk about, you know, the ability for, uh, like in Castro Huerta, um, you know, and, and McGirt in those cases on, you know, tribal sovereignty and what that means. I think we see these kind of like waves of things and, and we see more cases going to the Supreme Court for Indian law cases, because that's, the relationship we've developed right with our supreme court and, and tribes is you know that relationship we talked about early on like why tribal tribes um, a lot of these issues sometimes go straight to the u.s supreme court right um or not straight to but they go through the process to where mm -hmm. they get to the supreme court um after going through the federal federal system um and i think we're always constantly having the supreme court kind of hangs things out there um, sometimes intentionally, unintentionally, and then they have to come in and kind of rein and, and dial things in. Um, I think like Castro Huerta, um, you know, in some of those cases are, are examples of how, you know, for example, you know, I, I think in my opinion, um, being able to manage and protect the, the, the very people, um, you know, our members, um, even if a non-member commits a crime on them, um, I think it makes a lot of sense that we have, um, you know, a, a vested interest in protecting um, the health, welfare, and security of, of that individual. Um, and part of that process is to protect them from incursions by, you know, someone who might be not Indian, right? Um, and so, you know, we have a case called Oliphant, which um, at one point said tribes don't have um, criminal jurisdiction over um, non-Indians. Um, we also um, had a case, uh, um, uh, prior to that, where um, tribes were said they didn't have jurisdiction over Indians of, of other tribes that's since been um, the Duro fix is what they call that has been addressed. So um, tribes have the ability to, to prosecute Indians of, of other tribes um, on our reservations, but for some reason we don't have the ability to prosecute a non-Indian um, unless there's, you know, there's some exceptions for like domestic violence and, and VAWA under the Violence Against Women Act. There might be some specific, um, you know, things that Congress has said we can go do, but you know, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say, well, you can't prosecute these into you can prosecute these individuals if they do something bad. We can't prosecute this individual if they do something bad, right? Um, and so, um, especially if they're 
can prosecute this individual if they're a non a non Indian. Um, so to me, um, I think that sets up some some real um, bad issues in Indian country, especially in the when we talk about like um, the world of you know missing murder indigenous people, and we talk about domestic violence cases on Indian women um, committed by the non non Indians. Um, it creates a, a, a a jurisdictional nightmare, right? Getting trying to get law enforcement to prosecute those cases has obviously been um, uh, very problematic, and obviously, getting people to recognize that we're um, that our lives are um, worth have the same value as everyone else's has been a problem too. And the statistics speak for themselves, right? When you look at the the statistics for missing murder indigenous people, um, the statistics on on um, missing murder indigenous people is much higher. So uh, obviously, that to me, until that gap's closed, um, our lives aren't considered to be of equal value. So I think, yeah, I think those cases and those rulings are are, are problematic. I think that the, the court's gonna continue to evaluate uh, different issues. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I Congress um, doesn't do it very often uh, and react to, to some of those sorts of cases, but I, I really think in this one, it would make a lot of sense that said, um, the Supreme Court I will surely be considering future cases and there might be fair, more clarification on things. But, um, you know, I know a lot of people, uh, especially in the Indian law world, who think, you know, like Castro Huerta is very specific to like Oklahoma and that tribe doesn't have this broad sweeping authority. I, you know, I can see that perspective, but I also think it has a dangerous precedent in it as well. Um, we have one more question, time for one more question. And um, so you have exactly two minutes and then um, I will steal back your time so we can let go people uh, go on time. But uh, on your earlier topic of uh, Cherokee removal, can you share your thoughts from an indigenous legal perspective on the rulings that have come down in recent years? And I think you just mentioned, you know, some of those regarding the tribal sovereignty of Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think that's kind of the, you know, like Oklahoma in, in the McGirt case, you know, said that the eastern part of Oklahoma is is recognized as Indian country. And so there's some uniqueness to, you know, the the status of, of Oklahoma. In that case, the, the court had um, said that the court held that the Creek Nation's reservation in eastern Oklahoma had actually never properly de-established and therefore remained Indian country. Um, and so, you know, we had uh, the, on one hand, we had that the federal government had exclusive jurisdiction to prosecute him, a non-Indian for a crime committed in, um, um, against his stepdaughter who was a Cherokee Indian um, in Indian country. And the state uh, lacked jurisdiction. And the state obviously argued that they, they actually did have jurisdiction. Um, and some of the court's language, um, the court actually said, yeah, the, the state does have jurisdiction here. Um, and some of the language in that particular case was very, in my opinion, very problematic because um, it kind of went against a lot of the, the precedent we've seen, um, you know, since since those cases that I, you know, the, the, the Marshall Trilogy cases that I discussed um, going back, you know, as far as the, the 1800s, right? The 1830s, um, uh, 1820s. So, you know, I think we have longstanding any law and I think there's still some distinct, we need to, the court will probably end up distinguishing that in the future, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, maybe Congress will do that for us before they do. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what's, you know, I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more native voices rising up and, you know, wanting to claim what it, what is right and what is just. And I, I'm really curious to see uh, what happens over the next few years. But there are a lot of appreciations for your knowledge and um, for taking your, you know, your, your time to share this with us, especially with a new baby. So lots of appreciations. Um, and I, I thank you so much. Um, I was so delighted that, you know, hey, I know a senator, I can call and say, hey, could you come and talk to us and share your knowledge? So thank you so much for for availing yourself folks you're gonna want to join us on tuesday night because it's mike jetty 
and he's going to be talking about finally, um, you know, blood quantum and some really uh, some of the topics that have been coming up in in your suggestions in the feedback. So please do make sure to to join us for that. Um, I do see a request for the the link for the um, the survey. Remember that the survey link is also always on the sign in sheet, and the survey link is also in your reminder letter. So um, you've got multiple ways to get that if I am being a facilitator and, El and Joan just posted it. Thank you so much. So everybody be safe, stay warm. Senator, thank you so much. And Mazal Tov on, on your baby girl. I hope I get to meet her soon. And I hope you have a, have a very productive um, session and I wish you all well. Thank you all so much. We'll see you Tuesday night.